Hey guys, my name is Pixie, and today we're going to talk about setting up a task that can only be completed once per day. This is actually one of my most requested videos, but I haven't done a tutorial on it because there are some really great, super easy tutorials on the subject. One of my favorites is from Italo. It's perfect, it's simple, and it works. And I'll link it in the video description so you can check it out. Before you get started, I recommend watching the Fusion Table and API tutorials first. Both tutorials are more advanced, and they're very long and very in-depth. So if that's a bit over your skill level at this time, that's okay. You can still watch them to get a better understanding of the information. Otherwise, I would just use Italo's quick and simple tutorial to get you started. That being said, you may be wondering why my video is a million hours longer in comparison. Well, one of my subscribers brought up two good points. We all know that anyone with a rooted phone can access their TinyDB file and change whatever they want. So you don't want to store something like points in the TinyDB because the user can just give themselves a million points. Also, what's to stop the user from changing the time on their phone, thus exploiting the system? If the game says you have to wait 24 hours, they can just go into the settings on their phone and fast forward the time so it looks like it's been 24 hours even though it's been 24 seconds. So the solution I came up with was to store the timestamp in your database, either Fusion Table or Firebase. Personally, I prefer Fusion Table, so that's what I'm going to use. And instead of local time, we're going to use a UTC timestamp, which stands for Coordinated Universal Time. This time is based off of a world clock rather than local system time. For example, your local time might say 2 p.m., but the UTC time might say 6 p.m. There are a couple of APIs we can use to get a UTC timestamp, but I found one that's actually really simple and easy to understand, and the website has a couple of extra neat things we can look into. I chose this API specifically for how ridiculously easy it is to use. Click on the first link to get the current timestamp and date. This takes you to a JSON output that shows the local time, the UTC date, a bunch of other stuff, but we want this timestamp right here, which outputs the coordinated universal time represented in seconds. You'll also notice that you can plug in that timestamp to get more information about it. So let's copy and paste this link into a new tab. In this new tab, you can see that 10 digit timestamp shows my local time and the global UTC time. You can close this tab out if you want. Just remember to keep the previous tab open because we're going to need to copy and paste this link later in the blocks editor. Now we're ready to head over to Appy Builder and get started. This tutorial actually isn't going to have a fancy design. The point is to understand what it's doing so you can apply this concept to your mini games like the scratch card game or Wheel of Fortune. So if you want your users to play a game once per day, you would just incorporate these blocks onto that screen. Now, of course, we do need some components on here in order for this to work, so let's add a label and a button. Don't worry about making these look pretty, you can play around with how they look later. I will rename this to Label Countdown, and I'll change the font size so you can see it a little better when we test the app. Next, we need to add a web component, but we don't need to change any properties. This will allow us to get the data from the API. Then we need two clock components. The clocks will have the same properties, but will do two different things. For both clocks, uncheck Timer Always Fires and uncheck Timer Enabled, and make sure both intervals are set to 1000. Call the first one Countdown, and the second one is Delay. Lastly, we'll add a Fusion Table control using the exact same properties we used in the Fusion Table tutorial. For this component, we want to make sure to add our API key, the same P12 file, the query should be set to show tables, we'll use the same service account email, and check the option to use service authentication. We'll also be using the same Fusion Table from the Fusion Table tutorial. Keep in mind that you should be using your own Fusion Table data, but you are more than welcome to play around with this one. You'll notice that I've added a timestamp column. Right now, all of the values for this column are blank. In the Blocks Editor, we'll be able to add a value to this timestamp cell, and we'll also be able to see that value in our app. Now that we've covered the basic information, let's head over to the Blocks Editor and make this work. Start off by creating eight global variables. Call these user ID, fusion table users, wait, t, timestamp old, timestamp new, new, and request. Hypothetically, the user is already logged in, so we should already have access to their user data. 
When the user logs in for the first time, you might want to store their user ID in a tiny DB, which will allow you to access their data from the Fusion table across different screens. Ideally, user ID should not be hard-coded in, but for time's sake, and also because I know you guys are smart enough to figure out that the user is hypothetically already logged in, we're just going to hard-code in the user ID. Looking at the Fusion table that we used in previous tutorials, you can see that user ID is Pixie Bomb. So you can set this number to whatever you want, as long as it's a user ID that appears in this Fusion table or your personal Fusion table. Remember that each Fusion table has a unique ID, which can be found in File About This Table. Since we're using the same Fusion table from the Fusion table tutorial, we'll be using the same unique ID that represents the user's Fusion table. Now we need to figure out how long the user should wait before they can access the event. I've decided that the wait time should be 24 hours, basically one day. The timestamp from the API is a 10-digit number, meaning we'll be working with seconds. There are 86,400 seconds in one day. You can set this wait time to whatever you want, but how do you know what to set it to? Check the video description for a link to this free online calculator. If I type in from days to seconds amount 1, that means 1 day equals 86,400 seconds. If I type in from hours to seconds amount 1, that means 1 hour is 3,600 seconds. If I change the amount to 5, that means 5 hours equals 18,000 seconds. And that's how we get our wait time. Heading back to Appy Builder, let's finish these global variables. T will be a counter variable for the delay clock, so we'll set this to 0 by default. And set the remaining global variables to blank text boxes. These variables will help us compare an old timestamp with a new timestamp. The new variable is actually a copy of timestamp new, and we'll talk more about that in a second. You should be familiar with this final variable called request if you watch the Fusion Table tutorial. This variable lets us pinpoint what we want to do in the Fusion Table event. Let's start with four very simple procedures. The first one is our initialize data procedure. In this procedure, set global request to data. We'll use this procedure to get a timestamp from the Fusion Table. We'll need to set up a query that reads select timestamp from global fusion table users where user ID equals user ID. If we zoom in here really quickly, you'll notice there's a space after the word from and a space before the word where. Then we can send the query to finish off this procedure. Next, we need a procedure called get timestamp from API. Remember this link from the API website. We'll need to copy and paste that link as the web URL. To establish that link, we make a call to web1.get, and that's all we need to do to get the information from that web page. The next procedure will return a result, so make sure you're grabbing the correct procedure block. Call this get data with two arguments named key and pairs. We'll use a local variable in this procedure named result set to a blank text box, and we need a do result block to get the result for this procedure. In this block, set result to look up in pairs. The key will be our key argument, and the pairs will be our pair argument. And if we can't find the pair, we'll just output not found. Then we can return the result. This procedure can be used as many times as you need, but in this case, we just want the timestamp, so whatever that timestamp is will be returned here in the result. Our last procedure is called toggle event with one argument named boolean. In this procedure, we're going to set the button that we used for our event to the value of Boolean. A Boolean value can only be true or false, so this will toggle whether we can interact with the button. If Boolean equals false, then we'll turn the countdown timer on. Otherwise, we'll turn the countdown timer off. In this example, the event is just a button, so realistically, you probably want a little more in this procedure. If you have any questions about that, feel free to leave comments below. Now we got to make all of this work, so scroll back up to the top and let's create the events. When the app starts, we need to check to see if timestamp new is empty, and if it is, we need to grab a timestamp from the API. After that, we can initialize the data from the Fusion table. The get timestamp from API procedure will trigger web1.gottext. If the response code is 200, that means we were successful in connecting to the API, so we can grab the data from that page. We need to get the response content from that page, which could look something like this. We want to put that content in a readable format, so we use the built-in JSON text decode to parse the response content. 
Specifically, we want to look for the timestamp key. So we'll use the procedure we created earlier to find the timestamp key inside of the response content. And lastly, we want to take that timestamp and store it in a global variable called timestamp new. Let's also make a copy of this variable and store it in the global variable called new. The initialize data procedure will trigger fusion tables control .got result. In the fusion table event, if global request equals data, that means we're trying to view the timestamp data from the fusion table. We can create a local variable called data array and set its value to list from CSV table using the result. That splits our result into a readable list. If the length of the second index in data array list is less than 10, that means the user does not have a value stored in the timestamp column because it's probably the first time the user has been to this screen. So let's enable the event. Otherwise, if a valid timestamp was retrieved from the fusion table, then we'll set timestamp old to the value of result, but we need to format the string result. An easy way is simply to replace the word timestamp and the line break, which is represented by forward slash n, with a blank text box. Then we can just disable the event. Otherwise, if global request equals update, we need to reinitialize the new data. This condition will occur when the user has played the event at least once. The purpose of the countdown clock is to enable the event as soon as the timer expires. This clock ticks once every second, so we'll also be able to see the time remaining until the event becomes available again. If new is greater than or equal to timestamp old plus wait, then we can enable the event. This means it's been exactly 24 hours and we can turn off the countdown clock. Otherwise, we want to output a countdown to the time we have remaining, so the countdown label needs to be updated every second. Start by incrementing new by one. Keep in mind that global variable new is a copy of timestamp new, so we have the original value stored in timestamp new, and we have a value that changes every second that's stored in variable new. The concept to convert our time into a readable format is just like the gold, silver, and copper currency converter tutorial, so this method might look familiar to you. We'll start with a variable called wait time, set to the value of new minus timestamp old plus wait. In the first nested local variable set, we need to find the hours and the remainder. To get the hours, we need to divide the wait time by 3600. This is because there are 3600 seconds in one hour. We'll need to round this value up, so we'll use the ceiling block to do that. The actual value is going to be a negative number, so to turn that negative into a positive number, we multiply by negative one. For the remainder, we can copy and paste most of this block. And as you can guess by the name of this variable, we need to get the remainder of wait time divided by 3600. This remainder value will allow us to convert the minutes and seconds, which we'll need to round down. Minutes is represented by remainder divided by 60 because there are 60 minutes in an hour. To get the seconds, we want the remainder of the remainder variable divided by 60. The easy part is to display these values in a label. We'll need a join block with six items. First, we'll display the hours, followed by a lowercase h, then minutes with a lowercase m, and seconds with a lowercase s. This will give us a string that looks something like this. In this example, the event is just a button that you can press every 24 hours. Your event can be whatever you want. Maybe it's the scratch card or Wheel of Fortune minigame. Maybe it's just a new joke every 24 hours. So realistically, this button is the button that ends the event. As soon as the user pressed the button, we need to get a brand new timestamp because that means the new countdown will start before the user can press the button again. We'll also turn on the delay clock in this event. The delay timer just gives us a one second delay after talking to the API, then we talk to the fusion table, and then we talk to the fusion table again. We want to make sure that data isn't getting jumbled, so we need a bit of a delay. Global variable t will increment the clock tick by one. If t is greater than or equal to one, then we can turn this clock off, set t back to zero, and set global request to update. Our query for the fusion table looks like this. Update fusion table users, set timestamp equals timestamp new, where user ID equals user ID. Make sure there's a space after update. There should be a space before set and a space before where. 
Then we send the query to add that data to the Fusion table. There is no timestamp data for user ID 1 in the Fusion table, so the app starts with the event button enabled. You can also set the text for this label in design mode to be blank so that you won't see anything in the label when the app starts. As soon as you press the button, the app will need about a second to talk to the API and the Fusion table, and then you should immediately see the countdown timer begin. Now I could sit here and wait for an entire day to pass, or I can change the value of global weight to 20, which is 20 seconds. This app is running in real time, so the countdown timer changes to reflect the time we have remaining as if we had started at 20 seconds. And as soon as the countdown has finished, we can push the button again. So let's push it. And notice this time it starts counting down from 20 seconds instead of 24 hours. I can change the wait time again while the app is running back to 24 hours and the countdown gets updated. Now let's try closing the app. Notice that as we close the app, the countdown timer says 23 hours, 59 minutes, 34 seconds. I'm going to fast forward this footage and reopen the app and there you go. The time has been updated to reflect the time we were gone from the original timestamp. Good job guys, we are done. Visit my Patreon page where you can find out more about being part of the Pixie Bomb Squad. Check out the Appy Builder community where you can get help on projects you're currently working on and find more tips and tutorials created by community members. That's all for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Don't forget to thumbs up the video and have a great day. Bye!